I'm Ansi Perakula, uh, and will be chairing this this uh, this first panel. Uh, the, the theme of the panel is, is scale of participation and community belonging or community unbelonging, uh, and I sort of uh, anticipate papers which which uh, in which the sort of micro and macro perspectives, linguistic and political perspectives, and participation will be sort of meeting. So the the, the first speakers are. Uh, Lynette Arnold from Brown University and Hilary Parsons Dick from Ar Arcadia University, and their their topic is uh, from distant brother to dangerous animal, a trans 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 transnational participation framework of mi migrant interpolation. Uh, be before before uh, they start, just just to sort of. Uh, Note about the sort of organisation of, of, of the talks. Uh, the, the, all the three talks in, in this panel, and I understand also in the other panels, will be sort of uh, given, uh, like consecutively, and we have time for discussion at the end of the end of the panel. So please save your questions to the to the end of the panel, and then then you can address any any of the speakers. But now, Aunt Lynette Arnold and Hilary Parsons, please. please. Hi, everybody, um, and thank you so much for the invitation from um, Alina and Andy. Also, thanks to other organizers, Timo, Arena, Johanna, and also the staff, Katria and Kaisa, especially for your efforts um, to make this symposium a success. So the paper that Hillary and I will be presenting today is part of um, our individual work. We're both working on book projects, of which this is part, um, and we're also working on putting this together into a contribution for a special issue. So we do appreciate your feedback on this paper, sort of as a standalone um, entity. Before we start, just a quick terminological note. We'll be using the term migrant here in our talk when we're referring to people who are crossing borders. Um, and we'll hold the ter term immigrant um, to talk about, and related terms to the terms immigrant when we're talking about uh, policy, referring to folks who cross borders. In 1994, as El Salvador was emerging from over a decade of civil war, the mayor of the nation's capital of San Salvador constructed a monument dedicated to the country's migrants. The monument set out a vision for the new El Salvador that would emerge from the ashes of war, acknowledging the growth of the Salvadoran diaspora and situating this mobility within a chronotope of national progress. The monument's stark concrete arches broadcast Salvadoran modernity, as does its placement, in front of one of the few overpasses in the capital city, situated on the highway leading from the country's international airport. At this imposing site of movement in and out of the nation is inscribed a hailing cry in gold letters, Hermano Lejano, Bienvenido, Distant Brother, Welcome. The Hermano Lejano monument iconizes a future in which national prosperity is intertwined with migrant remittances. As such, it symbolizes a form of uh, interpolation by which migrants are hailed to the development of their homeland. This call draws on a familiar idiom of the nation as family in which migrants are positioned as self-sacrificing heroic brothers. Interpolating migrants as hermanos lejanos has proven to be an influential call to participation. In recent decades, the Salvadoran economy has been sustained by the billions of dollars in remittances that migrants send home each year. In May 2018, U.S. President Donald Trump hosted a White House roundtable with officials from California who opposed the state's sanctuary law, which rest restricts law enforcement's communication with Immigration Customs and Enforcement, also known as ICE. During the roundtable, the sheriff of Fresno complained that she cannot tell ICE about a migrant suspected of being an MS-13 gang member until a certain threshold of evidence is met. The MS-13, originally formed in Los Angeles, when refugees from El Salvador's civil war were relocated into the city's most dangerous neighborhoods. In response to Fresno's sheriff, the president made one of now his most notorious comments on migration. We have people coming into this country, you wouldn't believe how bad these people are. These aren't people, these are animals. This comment is part of a centuries-long discursive history in which images of animalistic south-of-the-border migrants have continually helped motivate draconian immigration crackdowns. Today, such crackdowns impact many more people than migrants suspected of gang involvement, itself a slippery category that frequently envelops people with no connection to gangs. As such, immigration policies and their associated migrant images are a devastating form of interpolation into the U.S. nation state. Uh, 
As the opening vignette suggests, images of Salvadoran migrants, whether as heroic distant brothers or animalistic criminals, have shaped the politics of participation not only within El Salvador and the United States, but with between the two countries as well. Such images are produced in and through what Hillary has called migration discourse, talk, writing, and other semiotic forms that summon up or presuppose, quote, the figures of personhood, rhetorical themes, forms of spatial reference, or logical propositions that people associate with the causes and consequences of migration, end quote. Migration discourse is a key site in which the politics of participation in and between nation states are envisioned and enacted as its production and circulation works to call people to the nation state in distinct ways. In developing this point, we adopt Goffman's uh, concept of the participation framework to elucidate the processes of interpolation that hail migrants. Drawing on Althusser's classic classical formulation of the concept, as well as his adaptation in more recent work, we posit interpolation as a form of call and response in which people become members of the nation through citizenship variegation. Citizenship variegation refers to the w ways that some groups are incorporated into the nation state by virtue of always being marginal to it. Uh, migration discourse is central to the production of citizenship variegation in both sending and receiving countries. Images of migrants help forge borders between those who belong within the nation and those who do not. Within such borders, these figures create shadings of belonging, an array of participant roles <coughs> organized around a putatively non normative non-migrant citizen who stands in contrast to various others. A central way the variegation of national particip uh, participation is envisioned and enacted is through state policies, whether these mobilize migrant remittances for national development or turn migrant bodies into fodder for detention regimes. So our main argument is that the Hermano Lejano and the MS-13 figures work in tandem as part of a transnational participation framework that interpolates Salvadoran migrants as exceptional subjects who are co-opted to state interests in ways that make them a resource for global political economic systems. This process generates the variegation of belonging um, through a gendering of migration. Discourses of the Hermano Lejano and the MS-13 gang member construct men as migrant others while occluding the experiences of women and children even in the face of a persistent demographic shift towards their migration. So that was the introduction. <laughs> and now we're going to continue by fleshing out our theoretical contribution a little bit more before we turn to the analysis first of uh, migrant interpolation in El Salvador and then in the United States. So Goffman's classical concept of a participation framework complicates models of discursive interaction by breaking down the roles of speaker and hearer into role fractions depicted in this table. The unique combination of these roles in a given interaction makes up its participation framework. Subsequent work in this tradition has demonstrate that demonstrated that cl attending closely to the changeable distribution and lamination of such participant roles can elucidate how processes can elucidate, elucidate how processes of inclusion and exclusion unfold. We build on this work by contending that processes of interpolation into the nation state rely on the production of participation frameworks with distinct roles into which people are called. A key site for the production of this, of this is migration discourse, as mentioned above. This discourse helps recreate um, uh, the imaginaries that establish national belonging and exclusion, which craft and distribute participant roles. Uh, the recreation of such state-endorsed imaginaries of, migrant of migrants projects seemingly stable, durative roles such as Hermano Lejano and the MS-13 gang member, where state-endorsed refers to that which is generated or sanctioned by state institutions. State actors assume the role of perpetual author and principle of calls to participation, positioning migrants as both figure and addressee. The apparent fixity of such participant roles helps to naturalize migrant interpolation making it seem as if their roles are facts of life rather than the result of persistent discursive efforts. The strength of migrant interpolation as Hermanos Lejanos or MS-13 gang members is such that they constitute what I have called ideologies of participation, normative understandings of how participant roles should be distributed. 
Nevertheless, such ideologies can be challenged. The subtle shifts in footing that occur in everyday interaction can potentially reformulate such participation frameworks and their associated roles. Migrants' responses to interpolative calls regularly involve critical revisions of state-endorsed imaginaries, as we discussed below. So Salvadoran migration to the United States began in the 1970s and has steadily increased since then, always being shaped by U.S. involvement in the political economic life of El Salvador and the region of Central America. Along with this growing movement of people has also come a growing discourse about that movement. The hermano lejano, or distant brother, is the central figure of Salvadoran migration discourse, appearing across discursive arenas from government policy making to news coverage to the celebration of patron saint days. This figure also animates a wide range of Salvadoran popular culture, from TV so shows to songs. Across these productions, migrants are mi mythologized as heroes who valiantly embark on a quest for a better life, while the political economic conditions that make migration a necessity are alighted. Such discourses mobilize neoliberal forms of participation, hailing migrants to find within themselves the solutions to the state's e uh, economic woes as co-participants in the national family. Imaginaries of the nation as a family bind polity members to the homeland through the inexorable ties of kinship, organized around variable participa participant roles in which citizens become distinct members of the family. Discourses of the Hermano Lejano call Salvadoran migrants to participate transnationally through a framework of close distance in which the production of a sameness that unites migrants and non-migrants emerges alongside a difference that pushes them apart. The Hermano Lejano remains close despite distance by taking up the call to send remittances home to the national family. This figure is contrasted with that of the selfish migrant who is corrupted by the individualism of the United States and thus neglects his familial duties. The figure of the Hermano Lejano co-ops migrants to state political economic interests in two interrelated ways. Firstly, in calling migrants to the nation by sending remittances, it integrates the products of their labor in the United States into the Salvadoran economy. Second, by setting up migration as the preeminent symbol of success, the Hermano Lejano also encourages future migration in continued service to nation state development. So as intimated in the introduction, the sending of remittances suggests that migrants assent, at least in some ways, to their hailing as hermanos lejanos. Um, up here you see a representation of uh, remittances over the last seven years, and in 2017 migrants remitted over $5 billion to El Salvador, 97% of which came from the United States. Calls to national participation that mobilize tropes of kinship frequently reproduce gendered forms of variegated belonging. The contrastive figures of the good and bad Salvadoran migrant are resolutely masculine, with the hermano lejano tied to the ideal of the male breadwinner, while the selfish migrant represents the specter of irresponsible masculinity that haunts such patriarchal norms. In figuring Salvador migrants as male, the imaginary of the Hermano Lejano affords a variegated citizenship that erases the contributions and experiences of women. Women have not only long made up a substantial uh, proportion of those who emigrate from El Salvador, they also reliably remit more than their male counterparts despite earning less. <coughs> These erasures lead migrants to critique and revise state-endorsed in interpolation, even as they assent to some of its terms. The concept of the participation framework allows for careful attention to both state-endorsed interpolation as well as individual responses to those calls, wherein the, nego the negotiated and shifting nature of participation is highlighted. In an analysis of w Salvadoran women's narratives, I found that women migrants problematize the gendering of migrant agency, situating the putatively normative figure of the Hermano Lejano as a markedly masculine figure that excludes their experiences. In so doing, these accounts highlight the erasures and uni universalizing effects of state-endorsed interpolation. But it is not only women migrants who respond critically to their interpolation as Hermanos Lejanos. In fact, this figure is often a flashpoint for contestation. Consider migrants' responses to the Hermano Lejano monument, which was discussed in the opening of the paper. While most non-migrants in El Salvador did not question the name of the monument, saw nothing to comment on, migrants themselves took grave exception to it. Migrant rejection of the name um, took center stage in 2002 during a contest to rename the monument which was sponsored by one of the country's major newspapers. The newspaper created an online forum where readers could submit possible names to rename the monument. 
the news, uh, this site was quickly appropriated by posters claiming to be migrants whose suggestions problematized the Hermano Lejano as a call to participation that pushed them to the margins of the nation. So here in this table, you'll see some of the names suggested. Overall, you'll see these suggestions do not eschew the familial imaginary of the nation, but rather seek to revise the terms of their participation in it. The largest group of suggestions, so this is examples one through five, um, point to migrants' motivations for participation in the nation state. These responses complicate the narrow economic framing of the Hermano Lejano, positing that migration mobilizes desirable eth eth ethical moral qualities, so for example, fervency, um, valor, solidarity. Example six um, uses wordplay, so moving from hermano lejano to hermano alejado, distant brother to distanced brother, to suggest the structural forces that drive immigration. A final set of suggestions, seven and eight, inverts um, state-endorsed uh, calls to participation altogether. So here we see migrants interpolating the nation state and also their fellow citizens who remain in El Salvador. Here migrants position themselves as interpolators rather than interpolated, asserting a power to call their homeland into a transnational relationship. The reader who suggested the winning name was a migrant living in Miami who used the award money to start a foundation to remodel the monument. You see the remodel uh, monument here. The name she suggested, Hermano Bienvenido a Casa, Brother, Welcome Home, officially became the new name of the monument. At the same time, however, the Hermano Lejano name has proven difficult to erase. The monument continues to be referred to with its old name as Hermano Lejano, so there's lots of traffic reports that refer to the location of the monument still as Monumento Hermano Lejano, um, not referring to the new name. Um, and migrants themselves continue to be identified as Hermanos Lejanos. This is an airport transportation ad from 2016. Okay. Thus, despite migrant responses to their interpolation as Hermanos Lejanos, Salvadoran migration discourse continues to call them to participate in the nation as exceptional gendered subjects who are distant from the nation but nevertheless integrated into state interests. In U.S. migration discourse, an imaginary of Salvadoran migration that features images uh, of unauthorized migrants as MS-13 gang members has recently become central in immigration policy debates. As intimated above, this gang emerged from U.S. involvement in El Salvador Civil War and was formed by Salvadoran refugees in Los Angeles. Today, the MS-13 is a massive transnational gang with ties to drug and weapons cartels throughout Central America. They have carried out alarming acts of violence which have terrorized the region and caused many to flee north. U.S. immigration hardliners use the persona of the MS-13 uh, member to create the migrant exceptionality that legitimates immigration crackdowns. If in El Salvador such exceptionality uh, is generated from uh, interpolating mobile populations as heroic to co-opt them to state economic interests, specifically development interests, um, in the US, the MS-13 member creates warrants for a state of exception in a Gamben sense of a perpetual state of crisis that generates calls to participation in which certain subjects are included in the nation through their exclusion from protection of the state. The MS-13 figure and the migrant imaginary of which he is part authorize a policy regime in which the realities of Salvadoran migration are elided to produce a dangerous mass who merit indefinite detention and unceremonious removal. Uh, just as the hermano, uh, sorry, just as the heroic hermano lejano is juxt juxtaposed to the figure of the selfish migrant in El Salvador, the MS-13 gang member is situated in U.S. migration discourse as part of a cast of characterological figures. These characters are positioned with respect to each other and the nation state through the creation and enactment of dyadic participant roles that are organized contrastively. The contrast that anchors these comparisons is that, of course, between citizen and migrant. This contrast is particularized through the elaboration of the profile of the MS-13 gang member, which can be traced in the rhetoric of immigrant immigration hardliners. 
In this rhetoric, MS, the MS-13 member is portrayed as young and male, not unlike the hermano lejano, but in sharp contrast to the distant brother, this persona is depicted as dangerously close and animalistically violent, a particular kind of masculinizing that occludes the experience of most migrants, men, women, and children. The MS-13 member is iconized in widely circulating images of menacing young men covered in tattoos. Trump foregrounded such a visions of migration when he made the ontological declaration that migrants suspected of gang involvement are animals. This declaration sparked a controversy as the president and his proxies doubled down on the inflammatory rhetoric. The Trump administration formalized this stance in a fact sheet posted to WhiteHouse.gov called What You Need to Know About the Violent Animals of MS-13. In this document, roughly the length of a paper abstract, the administration refers to those suspected of MS-13 involvement as animals ten times. The sheet remains on the White House website, neatly codifying the migrant imaginary that the MS-13 member iconically indexes. The sheet begins by positioning crime as the defining feature of Salvadoran migration, stating, quote, too many innocent Americans have fallen victim to the unthinkable violence of MS-13's animals, unquote. This framing is then bolstered by what has become a generic aspect of Trumpian migration discourse, a litany of chilling murders in which the perpetrators are suspected of MS-13 involvement. Trump routinely presents the MS-13 murders as part of a rampant scourge, despite the well-documented fact that Latin American migrants, including those from El Salvador, are far less likely than U.S. citizens to commit violent crime. The president memorializes MS-13 crimes at many public events, to which he has often invited victims' mothers, a group he refers to as angel moms, an ontological foil for the MS-13 animals. Here, the gendering of, Salvadoran, of the Salvadoran migrant as a beastly male murderer is complemented by the gendering of the innocent American as a heavenly female caregiver. This contrast creates a U.S. national family from which Salvadoran migrants are resolutely excluded. Such migration discourse erases the transnational relationships that have produced the MS-13 and Salvadoran migration, transforming immigration status from a shifting legal classification into a fixed feature of one's being. The production of migrant criminalization is forwarded in the migration discourse of Trump and his surrogates through the referential expansion of the term criminal migrant. In an analysis I did of Trump's public speeches since 2015, I found that Trump typically begins by using this term criminal migrant as a role fraction of the broader category illegal alien, which is actually a legal category, referring exclusively to people who have committed violent crimes. Then over the course of a given event of speaking, criminal migrant is expanded to refer to any person who has crossed the U.S.-Mexico border and defied the U.S. legal code. This expansion produces an indiscriminate dangerous migrant they that lumps together people who have traffic violations with people who have committed group, uh, brutal murders. Crucially, discourses of migrant criminality in the U.S. do not hail all undocumented migrants. Rather, a over 100-year history has turned the category illegal alien into code for migrants from south of the border. Figures of migrant criminality, such as the MS-13 member, are thus racialized forms of interpolation. Such racializing helps in turn legitimate immigration crackdowns, increasing public support for such policies. Racializing figures like the MS-13 member have strong emblematizing effects that hail migrants to their associated imaginaries, thereby actualizing, actualizing the world they project. To wit, the Trump administration has used the racializing rhetoric of migrant criminality to normalize the indefinite detention of migrant families, a policy that overwhelmingly affects Central Americans. Although crossing the border without authorization is a federal misdemeanor, this spring the, the administration began criminally prosecuting all undocumented migrants apprehended at the border. In addition, adults crossing the border with their children faced human trafficking charges. 
Uh, these policies authorized the removal of thousands of children from their parents while continuing to expand the population of incarcerated migrants. These policies, therefore, force Salvadoran migrants to respond to interpretive calls of, board, of, of border securitization, enacting them through this process as criminals. The U.S. detention regime not only creates the infrastructure for this state of exception, as with migrant exceptionalism in El Salvador, it also co-ops mo mobile populations to U.S. economic interests. The vast majority of immigrant detention centers are run by private prison corporations who profit off of the commodification of migrant bodies. While Salvadoran migrants are interpolated as racialized criminals, non-migrants in the U.S. are called to take up positions with respect to this participant role. In events like campaign rallies, Trump hails his audiences through, the emblematized, through emblematizing we-they contrasts. The they of the criminal migrant stands in opposition with those who defend law and order, the police, the border patrol, who are positively aligned with the us of Trump and his supporters, the proper we of the nation. Conversely, the criminal they becomes aligned with Trump's opposition, Democrats, Obama, Hillary Clinton, here Kamala Harris. Um, as a result, Trump's immigration regime has become part of his political brand, such that it is difficult to be a Trump supporter and not positively respond to the call to be an immigration law enforcer. However, cr migrant criminality also makes its way into the migration discourse of those who oppose Trump. The separation of migrant families this summer led to massive protests, which addressed the removal of children from their parents, but did not undo the criminal imaginary that helped authorize this policy in the first place. Rather, protests created a recursion of the same dichotomous us-them framework, this one rooted in a contrast between the bad MS-13 migrant and the good family migrant. Therefore, public outcry did little to change the processes of interpolation that legitimate immigration crisis. Backdowns. To be sure, family and child detention continues apace to this day. Although interpolation as Hermanos Lejanos or as MS-13 gang members may appear oppositional, these figures are in fact part of a transnational participation framework. Migrant interpolation in both countries involves hailing people to participant roles at and between nation state borders, a process that centrally relies on visions of transnational mobility and immobility. Moreover, these interpolations create similar occlusions as migration is mutually masculinized, erasing the actualities of migration not only for women and children, but for many men as well. At the same time, both forms of, inter of interpolation co-op migrants to the political economic interests of the state in ways that elide their needs and rights. There are also transnational processes that directly link these interpolations. The Salvadoran call that migrants participate in national development as hermanos lejanos is partly because the U.S. demands such development as a condition for foreign aid. Similarly, the U.S.'s hardline approach to migrants informs Salvadoran responses to the MS-13. Since 2003, Salvadoran administrations have enacted anti-gang policies known as mano dura or iron fist policies. These enforcement regimes are modeled on U.S. Um, approaches to migrants suspected of gang involvement. Lawmakers justify mano dura by mo mobilizing visions of am animalistic MS-13 members that are strikingly similar to those found in the U.S. I found in my research that such visions circulate really widely in El Salvador, even among um, otherwise politically pro progressive communities. Monodura policies have led to dramatic upticks in the violence that encourages migration, and it is used in the U.S. to justify the animalizing of migrants and their mass detention. So it might seem like these processes are hermetically sealed, but openings are created in the interpolative responses of migrants. Just as we show in the case of interpolation into Hermano Lejano, migrants also resist U.S. state-endorsed migration discourse that positions them as dangerous animals. Migrants are intimately aware of the ways that this hailing affects not only migrants who have been detained, but also those who endeavor to make a life in a country where they have been dehumanized. And as with the Hermano Lejano, critical migration discourse constitutes a key locus of response, which we will examine moving forward. Ultimately, as we hope to have demonstrated here, close attention to such migration discourse can illuminate the transnational dynamics of the politics of participation under current regimes of immobility. So thank you all for your attention.